Welcome to the WOMDA webinars. We're looking at the coronavirus pandemic and the impact it is having on startups in the Middle East and North Africa region. We have teamed up for, with a host of experts who will give their advice on ways to navigate the crisis. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Triska Hamid and I'm the editor at WOMDA. Today I am joined by Jason Nadal, founder of Centrado Advising. Jason has more than 20 years experience in tech building and turning around teams, as well as developing consumer and enterprise products. Jason has created and executed global strategies and successfully turned around failing ones. This includes transforming and leading teams at Microsoft and Oracle, where he was the vice president. Hi, Jason. How Hi, Jessica. How are you? Very well, thank you. Before we get uh, going, I just want to tell everyone that you're welcome to ask questions either in the chat box or raise your hands. The second part of this discussion will um, be down to you guys to ask your questions. So before that, Jason, yes. uh, you want to talk about recessions. Why? <laughs> <laughs> this is a good, good question. Um, I First of all, really appreciate being here and, and getting the opportunity to, to chat. Um, there's there's a couple of things. One, I love what you said about about um, you know questions and, and asking. I think that conversations uh, just between two when there's forty can probably uh, not be as interesting. So I'm really excited for people throughout to ask questions and and to take off mute, particularly in a virtual environment. I think um, one of the things we'll talk about is the need to pivot. This is a great example. Um, Triska was supposed to be there right like three weeks ago. Yeah, you deliver this and, and it, well, we were hoping it was going to be about a recession, but we we're going to be delivering some workshops that uh, we at Centrado have, have built over time. And, uh, and I was being invited with some of your partners, Microsoft for startups, uh, my old family, and uh, I was super excited. So I think it's interesting, like I have to pivot to this virtual environment. So it is so much better when we've got that interaction. So please, please don't be shy. Um, right, recession and recessions are runways. Um, that was the title of the talk and um, why recessions? I think that recessions have two, I, in my life and in my work, I try not to think about um, binary. I think when we, have, when we think about binary, we think about, you know, there's only two answers when we miss thousands of potential answers in between. And so when I, but when I think about, about startups or people that are thinking about going in and creating a startup during a recession time, that is binary. You're either gonna do it and you, and you gotta do it full fledged or you're gonna hold back. Or if you've got a startup and you don't pivot and you don't change during a recession and you stay on that runway, that runway is gonna start to crumble beneath you and waste away because you didn't change, you didn't change fast enough. But when it comes to recessions, I think that they, Time and time again, we talk about, we, we see things of new products, new and better mouse traps, and new directions that people take with their business and their products. And so while we are in um, a recession that we've never seen before, and it wasn't due to, you know, risky mortgage lending and financial, um, you know, uh, lack of financial oversight, let's say like we had 12 years ago, um, we, we, so we still have the outcomes of something that really was, was you know, uh, is, is a health related things. But that doesn't mean that we can't have opportunity to move forward and to create new things. So um, that's why I, I like the idea about a recession doing something with a recession. And that's why I like to think about it as, a, uh, as an opportunity uh, and a runway for, for innovation and growth. I mean, you mentioned that this recession is different. There really isn't anyone to blame for this one. Um, but in terms of the impact that it has uh, and the opportunities, will it be the same? I mean, can, can we learn from the previous re recessions? I 100%. So let's take back, let's, if we step back into the financial uh, collapse back in 2008, 2009, it's probably for most of us on the call, um, we, something that we've, we've lived through, right? Um, maybe 2000, 2001, with the first stop bomb collapse as well, there's definitely some takeaways there. 
um, more probably an attitude about, about how you approach building a company. But in 2008, 2009, it was interesting to see just an explosion of growth. And there are a few things that allowed that to happen. If you take a look at back in 98, 99, and 2000, it would cost you a half a million dollars just to get a startup up and running. You fast forward to 2000, 2008, 9, 10, you drop that down you know, by a factor of at least 10. So maybe, maybe it's 50,000. And then you fast forward to now, you get a startup up and running for, for $50. Um, and you know, that is both from a development perspective with the free tools that are out there, the, the, the hosting that's out there, and really the compute and analytics power that's out there if you wanna go digital. If you wanna go other areas, it's still, the, the cost to entry is just so much lower than it was you know, even just 10 years ago. But if I think about 10 years ago, and it was rooted in, in a financial collapse, there was still an increase, obviously, in unemployment and people being at home, which leads to things that people want to do around their home. Enter a company like Pinterest. Pinterest was, was built in 2008, 2009, around arts and crafts and showing people and providing a way for people to understand and look at creative ways to do things. And now you have tens of millions of people that actively follow a company like, like Pinterest and are lead to buy products and services from those that are, that are on there. And that was really a, a result of an outcome of what people were doing as a result of the impact from a financial crisis. If I take a look at Airbnb, you know, it's probably one of the most widely used examples, but it is very, very functional. But that was out of desperation. The founders founded in 2009, excuse me, 2008, and they pivoted a few times, but they thought about the idea right at the crash. And the, the, one of the main founders actually needed to have somebody sleep on his couch in order to pay rent the next month. So it was out of desperation that this creativity came. If I take, yeah, go ahead. I mean, is it, a, we're seeing a lot of uh, unemployment now, people being let go. So is now the time to start that business idea you've, you've always had? I mean, is it, is it right to start a um, business during a recession when there isn't uh, much investment money to go around? Well, yeah, you know, why not? I think that there is, you know, if you've been laid off of your job and you've always had an idea, the cost to entry to do it is so much lower than it was just even 10 years ago, right? And, you know, there is that, there is that fork in the road. If you are um, in an area that is thinking about needing help in warehouse last mile and things like that, you might want to go have a, a steady employment. Companies like Amazon in the US are hiring 175,000 workers, right? So there is an opportunity for people to go uh, have a job to hold them over during this time. But if people have been thinking about, I really wanna start something, this is, you've got time, you've got the resources and you have the connectivity like you've never had before. Okay. Investors are not shutting the door. They're becoming a lot more wise and they want to, they're gonna, they're gonna really look at how lean and mean that you can be during this time, but they are definitely not shutting the door. There's a report out of the UK that listed all the European VCs that they knew about that um, were still open for business to take, to take uh, and to give funding and take, take startups into their portfolio. So it is the time. I would say that if, if you have a business plan that talks about needing 300 people in an office for the next 18, 24 months without ever seeing a dime of revenue, you're probably not gonna get that funding. But if you are thinking about creating a, a product and a service that in particular is hitting the core of, of the pain that we're feeling right now all across the globe, that definitely will not go away in six months when hopefully we're all back. But that, that, you know, if you have a plan that has a, a distri distributed, uh, great, thanks, um, and has a, have a, a dis distributed working model and a lean you know, spend, 
those companies and you're addressing current needs now, VCs would be very interested in putting I mean, money. we've seen uh, yesterday, there were several announcements, VC investment announcements in the region. So they haven't stopped, but I think the kind of startups they're going after and um, the valuations has, has changed. So um, yeah. we're probably not gonna see the sky high valuations going forward. I think people will be a bit more conservative. Oh, 100%. And I think this is a great example of, of you, we expose now companies that were flying too high, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Valuations were getting way out of whack of what reality uh, should and it, it actually dictates to us. So um, I, uh, as I think about myself and in, in my company, in the ecosystem, I'm not necessarily pro VC or pro, uh, you know, family investment trusts. I'm not pro startup or pro accelerator kind of sitting in between to try to help everybody out. I can applaud them for saying, Hey, yeah, we're going to do this, but we're going to turn the cranks. We're going to turn the screws a little bit more to really understand what's here. Right. I don't think like, I don't even really need to go into it with WeWork's a great example. And that didn't even, there wasn't even a re. The recession is now pouring gasoline on that fire. But if you step back to a year ago and, and, and what was being exposed is a big wake up call for everybody. So, you know, you, if you've got a market fit, you've got a plan around your finances and you've got a team that can be built and work in the current constructs of our environment that we have to be socially uh, separated from one another. Those are the things that are going to attract VC. So with the last recession, we saw the rise in the gig economy and startups that really utilize that. Um, do you think that's going to continue this gig economy after this recession or are we going to see an entirely different way of working and uh, you know entirely different startups focused perhaps more on the at home services yeah i think you hit um i think it's a it's, it's a combination right so um i think after this how and we operate and how we connect with each other it's obviously going to, be, I, I feel it's going to be forever changed. Won't be so extreme as now, but it's going to change. Gig economy is here to stay. There's no doubt about that. You might see some people that have been doing a gig economy for the last eight years realize they want to run to safety and go back into the corporate world for that paycheck. But you're also going to see people, just as many or even more, say, I'm done with the corporate world. I'm done, you know, with that. I want to go do something on my own, what I want. And I want to be able to be freed up for everybody. You know, I, for me, I'm, I'm an example of that with my, with my own, uh, with my own company. Um, and even with the recession going on right now, I don't, I don't see myself, you know, running back. I love Microsoft. I don't see myself running back there anytime soon. And so I think it's about what is your niche? What's your lane? Now more than ever is finding that lane. Startups have, when we work with startups, we talk a lot about, about staying in your lane. And that doesn't mean that you, you, you shouldn't pivot right now uh, on certain things. But right now is not the time, if you are in FinTech financial payment services, is to not take jobs that say, Oh, hey, do you think you could administer our uh, IT services through remote for us for a while, right? Like that's completely off of the scope of your business. So it is more important now, I think, than ever is, 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 is in this gig economy and in this, um, this time is to really focus in on what you're good at and have clarity around that so that your investors know, so that your employees know and then most importantly, your customers. So they have a very clear understanding what you're offering to them and how they fit into that story. So I want to just go stick with the investment angle. We've seen uh, the announcement of uh, stimulus packages from governments all around the world 
they're worth trillions of dollars. Um, what impact do you think that's going to have on startups specifically? And should the government be spending money in this way? I mean, are they responsible for innovation at all? That's really, that's a very good question, right? We're, we're loading, governments are loading trillions of dollars of debt onto themselves right now, right? Um, trying to prevent the absolute cliff from falling. There is a responsibility in that is to take a look at the different industries as well and, and the different um, ecosystems. So if I think about the, the startup ecosystem, government, uh, most governments have always had um, an innovation focused program, right? So if you look at the US, a lot of medicine, the internet, those things are actually born out of government and government support. If I bring back a little bit closer, um, you all can tell that I'm, um, that I'm, a, you know, I'm an American, but actually I live in Portugal. And so if I think, well, this is a really great example of government involvement and why it's important. In 2012, 13, se several years after the initial um, collapse of the global economy, Portugal entered a really serious financial crisis. Triple digit, um, uh, deficits compared to the uh, versus their GDP output. Really scary time. And the economy just went under. To make it even worse, you had the more, the, the people that were a little more wealthy with means and education leave. UK, Canada, US, other parts of Europe that were, were not in the same situation. And so then you're really having a brain drain what's happening to add all to that. The government came in and they put aside conservative, liberal, socialists, they put that all aside and figure out what do we need to do to get this company, country back up and running. And so one of the things they did was how do we support the entrepreneurial layer? Because all the kids coming out of college were saying, I used to have the job, I'm going to have a lifetime job at the bank. I was going to go work for the government forever. That's not available to me anymore. And when you have a limitation of opportunity, you have an explosion of creativity and new products, markets, and services that are born. The government realized that and started to put specific funding around that and, and a program in place for investment to come in through the EU and investment to come in privately from other areas in order to support that program. That was the eco startup ecosystem that really started to flourish in 2012 and 13 here in Lisbon, up in Porto and throughout the country. Add into that other divisions of the government that weren't directly supporting that, but put in very favorable and attractive immigration policies to bring brain, talent and experience in so that the fledgling startup ecosystem could then actually have the right talent and support and experience that's needed in order to foster and grow. So there absolutely is a responsibility there. I also think it's an opportunity. The US trillions of dollars, for example, are now in going into the economy that the government is borrowing. They're gonna to need to track it. They're gonna to need to uh, make sure that it's, the, the process is all right. And we're already seeing all the problems that old systems and places and non-digitally um, focused uh, infrastructures are now failing in that program. So there's opportunity there for companies to then help out the government. So it's definitely a both way street. It's not just here's some money and go. There's also opportunities on how companies can be built to support that. I mean, there seems to be this desire amongst governments to give provides the stimulus packages to the larger companies that employ thousands of people but what are the benefits of supporting the startups and the ones with say five employees yeah small business runs most of the world's economy right and so they are always the last one to the table to get fed and they're always the you know then they're, they're going to be some of the last ones to to uh, to get the food at the end of the day and to, to have the means to be recover unless you have specific programs that are designed for them. There's no doubt that, that you know, 
giving guaranteed loans to the airline industry or to to other impacted industries is a, is a smart move to make. But the the smaller really becomes the, it's like, you know, it's the triangle, right? The, the, at the bottom of that pyramid or that triangle really is small business. And if that goes away, you're millions and millions of jobs. I, mean, um, I don't know what the unemployment has risen in the Middle East. Uh, I haven't checked on that lately, but. I don't know. think there are official stats, but it has. We, we've seen from the ecosystem, particularly in the startup sector, or people are being redeployed. So, um, uh, workers uh, at the uh, shopping malls in clothing stores have been redeployed to work in the supermarkets that have seen massive demand um, rises. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look at the U.S., like all over the world. Any traditional retail shop is done. You're not going to come back. But if you're a clerk at a retail sh store, there is demand for your skill set right now in the marketplace. Warehouse, last mile delivery, um, in, uh, in, you know, a, a grocery store, like you were saying, there is absolutely a, a massive need for that. That won't go away anytime soon. So there certainly is a redeployment, um, and a re redeployment need that's out there. Okay. Where the government can facilitate and help that out is beneficial for the government because I can get that person off of my payroll, me, the government's payroll and onto private industries payroll. That is the goal. So their responsibility in all of that is how do I help take m masses of people that no longer have a job in a certain in, in an industry and get them into a you know tangential industry where there's massive demand. Let's go back to the COVID specifically. What yeah. kind of themes have you seen emerging right now? Well, I think there's a couple of areas. Is what is low touch? Okay. What is last mile and what is home? So I'll give you, if, if I'm a designer at a startup and I'm laid off, but I've got design background and skills out there. There are so many people stuck at home right now that are doing home renovation projects, right? There's enough people out there with means that are saying, I'm going to paint the bathroom. I'm going to retile the floor. I'm going to do this because they can't bring somebody in to do that doing it themselves. Right after this call, if I was a designer, I would put up a website and have packages available around bathroom design package, $250. Living room design package and, and, and furniture recommendations, blah, 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 you know, $750. Start to create things that people are looking for right now inside of their home. Healthcare. I think, I think there's going to be a massive swing. We were seeing it a, a little bit driven by corporations around home health. Whether it's digital, like a teledoc, which has just exploded over the last uh, three months. But testing, not just coronavirus, but all sorts of lab testing, home doctor visits, um, home um, you know, other services. You are going to see that from a healthcare perspective explode. And there's also no doubt about home, gym, and health. That's another great area around the home and around health that is, that is going off the chain. I've helped a few of our um, people that I know, small business, who run CrossFit boxes and CrossFit gyms. That's a binary thing. Either you close up shop, lay off your people, and you're done, or how do you get people exercising in their home, using things that they have without having to go buy extra material? How do you take the material from your own gym and give it to them so that they could use dumbbells, weights, and things like that? These are opportunities that didn't exist. And I've talked to a couple of, of, of people I know that own CrossFit gyms that are saying that they will always now have an online presence in, and a remote one-on-one -on -one coaching even after this disaster is over. So they created a new product stream of revenue for people when they actually even go back to the core of their business becomes healthy again. So a lot of companies will have to pivot now in order to survive, but what's the best way to, to build that business strategy? How do you go about kind of 
essentially not just pivoting, but launching something entirely different to what you had before? I think there's a couple of things in that, and you, you hit it. I mean, pivot is the, the name of the game, right? It's, the, it's probably going to, I don't think it can ever be overused because this is about survival, right? This is what we're doing. So in this, this current recession, I think that there's a couple of, of themes. There's three themes uh, that I think are, and then if we'll take that, if we could, we'll just take that into then what and how. Is that, is that fair? Yes. So, um, so, and also too, I just want to make sure that the, the, the room's really quiet. Are we hitting on things that, that are helpful for you all, or do you just want a message or something? If anyone, nope. just, just type in the chat and we'll be able to see it. Okay. Yes, it's fantastic, they're saying. Okay. <laughs> Carry okay. on. <laughs> good, good. My, my, uh, okay, good. This is really great. Okay. So, because this is really, I think for a lot of you now, we're getting into, you know, this is, I think one of the things Triska and I talked about is, is um, really diving in deep into, into, into what does history teach us? what's happening now, what's, what's different is really important, no doubt, and getting deep instead of just the, the one little line here and there. Making it practical and providing thought and tools for you all to take is exactly what we hope to get out of this. Um, you know, for me, that's, for my business, that's all I focus on. Strategy, but in a practical sense that can be then gone and applied and execute immediately. And so I'm really glad to hear this is really uh, getting you guys what, what you want. Okay, so current recession. Three big themes that I'm seeing out there is the pivot, generosity rules the day, and clarity. When you're clear about what you're doing, customers know how to engage. So let me just take pivot. Pivot and being creative. I think the CrossFit gym is a great example. Um, I think anybody that's in home services where you can do something or construction and help people either buy, get, or do remotely is great. Um, anything around helping out with big data is fantastic in helping government and big business understand what they're doing and how they're doing it. Uh, there's an AI company in, in London that I, that I have helped out this last fall and winter. They do, they take ad campaigns and marketing campaigns and that sit, the data sits in all these different types of systems. They basically take a, a wrecking ball to those different data systems and they pull it all together into one number that gives you actionable information. It saves companies like Coca-Cola wasting a million dollars on, a, on the wrong ad campaign. They can stop it immediately after they see it's not working rather than three weeks later looking at the data and saying, oops, we just lost $3 million. They should be lights out, absolutely busy trying to hire 10, 15, 20 more people. Because if any big company out there, what are they doing? They're pulling back, they're pivoting. Their pivot is different than a startup's pivot. A big company's pivot is, what's non-essential? What are the expenses I can root out? And how can I conserve cash? So for a startup, your pivot should be, I can show you where you're wasting money. I can show you how to repurpose people. I can show you where, you're, where, where is non-essential with my software platform or my, my particular company, right? So that pivot is about being creative and planning and understanding what is driving your customer base right now. When I think about being generous, brand and brand value, you can use that as a strategy, right? So we're seeing, you were talking about how government is giving loans um, to businesses right now. Because of technology, because of information that's out there readily available, and because of social media, We've all seen how many companies are getting shamed left and right for doing the wrong thing. 10 years ago, they could hide behind that, grab it, nobody will know, three, four years later, everybody will forget about the pain that everybody was in that they took advantage of, right? Not any longer. 
And so what are you thinking about from you as a brand being generous for others, right? It's not to say, hey, 90% off of my product or service, but that is, hey, here's the package product that we give to you. But you know what? I also took the extra time to notice that you really could use X, Y, and Z. And I'm just going to give that to you for free because I think it's going to help you, your business, or your family, whatever product and service you provide, right? What are the chances that that person says, no, I don't want it, don't mm -hmm. want that extra? And what are the chances that they would say six months down the line, like, oh, I'm never doing business with them again because they were too generous to me? Right. How do you strike a balance between getting the right tone and not coming across as being opportunistic or riding off the back of, uh, you know, a certain bandwagon? No, it is like you. Um, I saw a, a video mashup on Instagram the other day and everybody's doing the black and white video with the somber music about how they're there for them and they understand the pain that they're going through. Complete white noise and that for a lot of them it comes across as completely tone deaf so the balance is hey yeah there's a problem right i'm not a, there was a jeans company that actually were telling their customers an email that that they're there for them like oh really okay because you sell me jeans so figure out back to this pivot around the problem that they have and how you can go solve it for them. And that's the strike. Over communicate and do it clearly with action and intention that benefits them. Telling them that you're there for them because you sell jeans, no. Hey, what we're doing is we want to do a buy one, get one free. We turn our factory into making N95 approved masks. What we'd like to do is you know, you buy a packet of 10, we're going to give 10 to, you know, families in need, right? What, what if that's, that's not? Great, that's a great balance. But what if that's not financially viable for a company? If they, they cannot, you know, pivot in that way? Yeah, there's other, there, are, there are other ways, right? So these are, um, if they can't pivot that way, I would argue that there's something that can be done. And it might be a combination of, hey, we have to, to slow down and, and hold off on, on things, or um, I can't just, I can't be in a position where I'm giving away services all the time, but there is, um, there is a balance there. So maybe we could, we could actually, you know, if anybody wants to open it up um, and talk about some of the things that, they're, that their business or maybe the problems that they're seeing about their pivot. But um, if we, it's easier to use like concrete examples, right? So, um, because I think our first, a lot of people's first reaction is, I can't do it. Like there's, we, we, I don't know what to do. So I, I honestly, for me, my business, it is, it is interesting. It has a little bit uh, gone very, very slow. It's slowed up quite a bit, but, and I could have said, well, okay shut the doors for a while and turn the turn the lights back on in, in six months um but then i was like wait a minute there's there's help that, that i can give so we can talk about it later but um there's a uh, if you went on my website you'd see that like i'm giving 30 minute strat strategy review session for free i'm also opened up a new product for me and, and it's a real baseline product for 9.99 euros and it's it is that 30 minute call plus three more and a report of here's what you should, here's a recommendations of what to do around your strategy, around your message and around your sales. And so it's about how do we get creative? I didn't think of that until like, like two weeks ago, right? I wish I thought of that six weeks ago because startups are thinking like, oh my God, wait, wait, oh, a thousand euros. That actually is really great. So obviously a discount of what I would normally do, but it was a right product for the right time. You have to strike the balance and, and you'll learn, you'll learn the balance as you go. It will not hit first draft, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that people kind of un can understand. Um, we have a f our first question on the chat, mm -hmm. but um, Abdul Masin, if you want to open up your mic, then you can ask it. Otherwise I will just read it out. Mm -mm. Okay. 
Um, so he was asking whether you could speak a bit more about the characteristics of organisations that are strong financially. Um, as an early stage startup, how do we go about building that critical component of our business? Okay, so what is that critical, critical component of your business? Uh, Abdul Mateen, if you'd like to yeah, sure. speak. Um, you mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago about how um, financially strong organizations are, uh, can persevere through these, um, through these times. That's been a, a regular recurring theme, theme throughout uh, the past few weeks. So as a startup, how do we go about building a financially strong organization. Ah, that's what you're talking about. Okay, not the product, but the financially strong yeah, organization. Yeah, as an organization, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think that there's a couple of things. Number one, this should have been done six weeks ago. You call any of your of people that you have credit with and you uh, that you owe money to, and you change the terms. Number two, you call your landlord and you say, guess what? We're changing the terms. I, I, are you open to changing the terms? 100%, let's say in a building of, of 50 businesses, the first five, six, seven that do it, they're gonna say yes to, right? They wanna keep you rather than to get rid of you. So look at the areas that you can draw down your costs. The second area is take a look at what is the core and essential of the business and then what can be put off for a while. The third thing is, is then start to uh, leverage others. So I know one of the great things I, I see, and I'm so excited to, 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 to be there two weeks ago. And so we'll have to do it. Hopefully I'll get invited and uh, we'll come and get to meet each other in person someday. But one of the things I love was this really cool, strong ecosystem that's happening there, right? So you have companies like whether it's Amazon or Microsoft um, that are, that are, that help out for free to startups like you all. It's my, that's like my fifth call is to say, you've liked my, my product and service. What customers do you have regionally that are going to want this right now? And how can I go in hand in hand with you to go do that? So there you have to kind of prioritize out what is non-essential and what can be put off for six, eight, 10 months? And then what do you need uh, right now to continue with that, that strong balance sheet and then look for the opportunities to help maybe expedite or, 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 or expand new, new opportunities for you right now? Okay, if anyone else has a question, then either raise your hand or just type into the chat box. I've got um, a good, I have a really great PDF. It's not my PDF, so I'll go find the original link. It's from a financial um, a, a company that focuses on small small businesses, um, and uh, and he has like a financial checklist of what to go through. And I'll go. Um, um, it's Mike. Name's blank. I'm blank on the name. It's Michael something. But it's a really good checklist, and it, again, it's very practical. And so I will do. What I'll do is I'll grab that. Um, link and um, and then if anybody wants the the want um, uh, I they can you guys can drop me an email or something and I'll send it to you. Um, before we ask uh, some of the other questions from the audience, I want to get a sense of the short term versus long term thinking uh, for companies now compared to the last recession in two thousand and eight. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. I think that, um, you know, I think number one is we, we just don't know the length of this, right? So we know typically um, outside of the Great Depression, typically recessions are, you know, two, three years long and before we are well into the recovery before people say like, oh, the recession's over. I think for this one, it is really, is actually, this is what the, the, the scary part is that we just don't don't know. And so when I think about long-term thinking, so in the last recession, um, the short term was just lay everybody off, kick everybody out of their houses. You can't make your mortgage payment, you're out, which just dragged everything further, further, further down. This time around, uh, you notice that the banks are actually proactively calling and proactively emailing customers saying, hey, if you're affected by COVID, let's talk. You know, we'll, we'll do a 90-day moratorium on your mortgage. 
like that. There have been, I, I wanna say something like 5 million homes in the US that have done that in the first month. And so there is a definitely a long-term that the banks now would, would be playing, that they don't want to go back to these assets that they have a hard time getting rid of. Rather, what can we do to work with our customers? And so there's definitely more of a long-term up, uh, approach to that. You see um, a lot of companies that are trying to repurpose their employees and trying to put them on temporary furlough with government support so that they can get them back. There's just a different approach that people are taking now versus before when it was like, should, like, oh, we got, I got, we got a quarterly call with Wall Street in, in uh, three months. So they're going to want to know exactly like how many, how, how good did we cut? How many people did they cut? And this is different mind shift about how do we want to be perceived and what do we want our brand to bounce back with in the recession? Any company right now, long-term, here we go, is a great long-term. Any company right now, startup or big, that does not have an automated sales funnel approach to customers, which is an email campaign oriented approach, needs to get one five months ago. Because you've got to position yourself now in a pivot but also too ready for a bounce back when people can buy your goods and services. And so the long-term thinking has got to be beyond just the, the four or five months. How do I prep myself? Because there's the, all the data out there is, most of the data out there is telling us that that demand for goods and services isn't back is going to, going to skyrocket as we come out of this thing. And so you, are you put, are you, if you've laid everybody off and you shut everything down and you didn't do any type of pivot, you didn't continue to reach out to your customer base, they're not going to know that you're there when things get better. Is this the first time that we've seen an element of humanity being played out during a recession? Um, I think that's probably pretty extreme, right? Okay. But I think that technology and platform and social, this is an oddly intimate, right? Uh, another intimate recession for us being so remote from one another. Mm. And so I think you definitely can say that there's a much more of a human element and, chem and, and uh, a, um, a humanity to all of this, for sure. I also don't think that, you know, you took 12 years ago, you've got people that, you know, were, uh, hated the banks and hated everybody that was getting bailouts and then took the money for their cash reserves instead of doing right for employees. This wasn't really a financial situation or blame of a financial institutions. And so there is a, an automatic humanity because we're also talking about health and people's safety and security. So we're naturally drawn to that and because of the problem. And then I think the other aspect is, is that like, you realize like, I don't want somebody else to go suffer, so I'm gonna stay back, or I don't want somebody else to suffer, so I'm gonna go get them what they need. More so than we've seen before. Added to that, or the, probably the, one of the key underlying pieces of that is that we've allowed ourselves the last 12 years since Instagram, founded during a recession, by the way, mm -hmm. Instagram, is that we've allowed people to be filmed into our they, we've allowed them, we've opened the door to our own personal space more so than ever before. And so there's an automatic humanity there, which provides also to opportunity for startups out there about how you're reaching out uh, to them, to those potential customers around the things that they're cherishing right now, which they'll continue to cherish very closely for the foreseeable future, right? More so than like dinners with the family, a lot more important. Hey, my kids right now, I hear them bouncing the tennis ball outside uh, my, my door. They're on their little lunch break from school. If they came in here, like it'd be no big deal. And they said, hi, you know, I don't know if that would be the same two years ago. You'd be a little bit more like even six months ago, cautious and making sure that, that none of that happened. But now like we're more accepting of of each other as people, not just as a colleague or a number that we're driving towards. And so I, I don't see that, that new shift changing. And I don't think we saw it as much 10, 12 years ago. 
So given that, how should businesses or startups think about their company? Yeah. So I think this is it. What I would do is I would focus on the digital. Okay. I would fo focus on personal services. I'd focus on things that are going to help in a remote way. Big data, imagery. Um, you know, in, in, in the Middle East part of the world, like, boy, wouldn't it be great to be flying drones right now through all types of construction sites, all types of, of, of you know, communities, all types of oil fields to understand what's happening there rather than putting a bunch of people together close to each other to go check that stuff out. Um, you look at like big data on government, how can you help them keep accountable the companies that they've given money to? Um, and then how can you be distributed? So I would be focusing my company that can survive in a distributed way, right? So, um, I mean, this is a great example. So my, most of my work is in person doing workshops. I've had a pivot to doing virtual workshops. I ran a session the last couple of days helping my client in Belgium on two things. One is evolve their business strategy immediately now and in, in post COVID, but also two, hey, what's the, what are our priorities? They had 18 priorities and we had to narrow it down into actually five priorities that are so clear that everybody in the company and their board can get, up, get around. Then we had to bring it to the board, but all that done was virtually, it was instead of being in person in an offsite together. And that's just what you have to do. So can you survive in a distributed way? And then people in supply chain. So any company that's, that, that has a platform that would be great with supply chain, single source supply chain, out. No more. Whether it's because of COVID or whether it's because of, you know, trade tensions, companies better make sure that they've got different ways that they can get the supplies that they need. And then, and then another, another thing to focus on is just being lean. So how do you translate that? I think it's, uh, you know, it's what I mentioned before, anything around the house, I mean, whether you design, health, doctor, self-care, home gym, if you can provide the infrastructure, the data, the solutions around things that can, can do that, or you're gonna supply things, that is fantastic. Um, and then, you know, I think transport, Transport's another big area. And then the other ones that I've mentioned, like, like government uh, support services. Um, and then what are we looking at from a analytics perspective and how are we using um, uh, imagery to help us, um, help us govern area, physical areas, help us analyze physical areas, help us think about how do we reduce the, the human contact piece right now. Okay. We have one more question from Omar. If you'd like to unmute your mic and ask. Give it a second. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you, what are the most important things for startups to consider now? So what are the things that they need to urgently work on? Like, I'm not, that wasn't... Not necessarily five, like... No, no, Triska, did, uh, did you guys um, plug that question to him? No, no. This is exactly what is next, right? This is kind of what the, the, this is exactly your perfect question, perfect timing. So there are three things, uh, three main things to, to address right now for your company, your business, strat your business strategy, that's an internal and an external. When I think about business strategy for, strategy for internal, going back to the last question is cash is keen. What is your runway? And what can you take down and out to extend that runway? Head count. You guys have already had to talk about this. I think uh, in, an HR um, professional or HR expert was on talking about, about people and head count. But think about like, can I delay that hire for six months? Or can I repurpose this person instead of laying them off? And would they be successful at this other job I need them to do now? Marketing. I would shift and I would double down on digital. I hear companies like Expedia, they're gonna slash, they spend five billion a year on, on advertising. They're not gonna even spend a billion this year. Makes sense, they're in the travel space. But around the areas that, that, that you're focused <coughs> on or a new product line that you know is, that you feel is gonna be a hit, 
double down on digital marketing. Why? I don't know about you guys, but on my iPhone, I have got that little weekly reminder, right? About how much time I was on my screen. Second week of COVID, of our lockdown, my screen time shot up by like 120%. Our eyeballs are here in digital. So double down on your marketing. Um, capital spend, rent, and loans. That's what I think about from the business strategy internally. Externally, think about market. Don't start off by hitting 50% off. To, that could cheapen your brand. Instead, give them something, uh, a, a product or a new service, and then be generous with that. We talked about that earlier. Um, the second area, your marketing message. So Triska talked about like, what's the balance? And you're gonna have to kind of find that balance. Don't get sappy, but don't be tone deaf and say, you know, uh, hey, uh, uh, you know, $5,000 trip to the Maldives. Like the, 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 it, you just gotta understand what people's minds are at and what, what's happening to them right now. We've talked about that on this call. So you want to address online, tell them what you're doing and how. Um, you want to be clear on that. So when I think about being clear is, you know, Triska, you were, we were talking yesterday about, as we prepped for the call, um, is, is what's the message that's out there? What's the message that winds up resulting and do people find out about, uh, um, about your messages? Is it, is it transparent? So it was Uber Eats and somebody else like started to jack all the restaurants to- So they, they already take a commission, um, the food delivery platforms, and they're, because it's Ramadan starting tomorrow, they wanted the restaurants to eat discount. Sorry, I'm busy. Uh, Nadia, just give us a second and uh, you, we'll, you'll get the opportunity to ask your question. And then I think, so that's a great example. So the third party came in and said, no delivery fees, restaurants, okay. we're here to help. So, um, I, you know, and so what is your transparency of your message? And then I think the other thing too is, is if cash is king, email is queen. You need to get people's emails and put together your sales funnels for automatic emailing and, and use the opportunity digitally right now to establish yourself as the expert in the space. Top five, top, top five things to think about in your, your self home improvement. Top five mistakes that you want to avoid when you're, you know, shopping for whatever. Um, you know, top five mistakes companies make when they think about their next big data solution. Those are the things you want to be giving out. You're the expert. Um, and over communicate. Again, eyeballs are on the screen. And then finally, a sales funnel is you want to become that expert. You want to make sure that you're touching base and you're communicating out. You also want to be clear in what you're offering. Uh, one of the physical workshops that we do is called Get Out of the Friend Zone. And it's actually about, um, it's not about dating. It's actually about uh, pilots and having a successful B2B pilot in an enterprise. So many startups really struggle with that and they can never really get out of that zone. At the end of the day, what it really is, is about clarity and communication. Here's what we're going to give to you. These are going to be the KPIs that we're going to measure off of that. This is what's going to happen after we meet those KPIs. Yep, I agree to that. Great, great, great. Now we have to communicate all throughout. That is about sales funnel and a sales acceleration. And so being crystal clear with our customer, what it is, how it is, why it is, and what is the result. Okay, we have one question from uh, Nadia, if you'd like to ask a question. Hi, Nadia. Um, hi, Jason, how are you? Thank you very Good. much. Uh, apologies for earlier. I didn't know I was unmuted. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> All right. Regarding the gig economy. So, um, you know, the U.S. is a very mature market and it's already contributing. Gig economy is already contributing around $1.5 uh, trillion to U.S. economy. Um, right now, um, so let me introduce myself. I'm uh, heading the operations for a tech startup. We are a digital skills and talent marketplace. It's okay. a freelancer's platform. Great. Uh, yeah, so we are UA homegrown, uh, but the concept is very new 
to the market. Uh, so, and, and I know that in your head, you, you have already reached the conclusion what challenges we are facing right now. <laughs> so we want to, um, you know, onboard companies, we want to onboard talented individuals. Uh, interestingly, in the past six months, we have already onboarded more than 1,200 people. Oh, to, to them providing, being willing to provide their service. They are providing their services. Some of them are employers as well. Um, okay. So there is traction. But what, I, what is your advice, uh, specifically considering the MENA region, from Middle East and North Africa, for example, uh, although we have the user base is already scaled globally, but for specifically for MENA region, um, with, with the new concept of talent marketplace, um, what, do, what, are your, what is your advice? What are your suggestions? How do we onboard companies? How do we, um, so this is the time for us. It is. It is absolutely. It is absolutely. Missed the boat. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to do two things here because you it actually kind of you're leading me into something as well. I know we're at the top of the hour, and if people have to leave, yeah. that's totally fine. I can go uh, over, but I want to make an offer before people leave. Is that um, particularly since I'm not there physically and having that interaction, I do want to help up on my website? I'll put the link in if, if you guys want. And this is just up to if you guys want to do this. Go ahead. Um, I'm offering three, a, a free 30 minutes to anybody that wants to have a, a, re, a review session. So Najee, we can take this uh, off and uh, up in the upper right hand corner is set a call and you just, just uh, fill out the information and, and, and get to me. What I will offer too is that I also do, do this for the call here is that the first, uh, um, we'll do the first three companies. It was just going to say the first one, but uh, Back to eating my own dog food, uh, generosity. So I'll do the first three that, um, that, that do want to have something and that reach out to me with, this, with that um, a, a sign up link in the upper right hand corner. I will also give to you that product that I was mentioning, that 999 product about more of a formalized review session and recommendations. Um, I'll offer that for the first three people for free. So, um, because I want you guys to make sure that you're successful and that you've got to, um, you know, that you're looking in your rear view mirrors and your blind spots. So uh, everybody who wants to, 30 minute call, the first three people to sign up, I also will give that 999 um, a gut check, if you will, that has a report associated with it and three more calls with me, I'll give that away for free. So that's because I'm afraid people might, might leave and not get that notice. We've already yeah. had a couple of people drop off. If, if you could answer Nadia's question very quickly, because I want to end with one final yes. one from Kavya. So, Nadia, so, so what I would do is the companies that you have, um, that you know, that skills that you've got, the 1,200 people, where they would, they would place well, I would get an, app, an email campaign driven to the, the business decision makers within those companies, probably through LinkedIn. And what I would do is I would message them out that you're here to help them. You want to understand a little more about their pain, but this is what you can solve for them. And there's three things, just we're gonna list three things that you can solve for them, right? So it is, you know, around headcount allocation, fine, you know, ongoing financial, uh, uh, you know, commitments that they don't have to have anymore and whatever project they need to get done is gonna get done. So I can, I'm happy to talk you through with that more, so. All right, I think this is the last question from uh, Kavya. Um, she says, we're seeing a lot of uh, collaboration between stakeholders and corporates in the industry to tackle the crisis, such as Apple and Google coming together to innovate with the use of uh, technology. Do you see this trend as part of the new normal that we're entering? Uh, the, the tech collaboration? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's definitely going to be some. Um, you have to look at the company, though. I'll give you two great examples. Microsoft, 90 plus percent of their revenue comes from partners, right? And there's a strive for them over the last five, seven years to be open platform and want to partner. You've got um, companies, there's other companies out there that are very first party oriented only. I would think that Google and Apple on specifics, they, they have no problem partnering up, but there, there's not gonna be like a big love fest going on between the two of them in other areas around outside of what does humanity need right now, right? Yeah. They'll come together on that. How do we help the government? We're gonna come together on that. 
but you see them on the business side or product development side, it's not what they're in the game for. <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to have to end it on that note. Jason, thank you very much for your time. I, Thanks to everyone for joining as well. I hope it was helpful or it continued to be helpful after we did the check-in. And I really appreciate those, those questions. So, um, yeah, uh, Triska, I'm, 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 I'm grateful. I'm, it was really fun. So I hope, hope it was thank good. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. And um, we'll have a recording of this up on our website, wonder.com. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Have a good day. Cheers. Bye.